welcome ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad that you could join us today. It is a beautiful day and I promise you it is a, beaut a beautiful day because of what we are going to discuss, what the program is all about. Um, God is going to speak to us at a personal level um, and God is going to reveal his will for our lives. And I believe after this uh, program today, your understanding and my understanding will be different. I am joined today on this program by a great man of God, someone who has served the Lord for many, many years. He's a man who uh, probably I would say is a national father by reason of what he has done and what he continues to do. I am joined on this program uh, by Reverend Gamaliel Mwanza, who is the president and founder of uh, Eagle Ministries International. Um, he served in Victory Ministries for many years, and actually he was one of the first uh, students that were produced um, by Victory Ministries. Reverend Gamaliel, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be home. This is home for me. And... Uh, you mentioned the, the first four students. Yes, sir. It reminds me the days would move the school, go where the crusade would be going. After class, go hang posters. From hanging posters, go to the crusade grounds. And I mean, it was a great fun. And uh, I wanted to say that I'm very proud and excited about Dr. Nevers Mumba. I don't care what other people say, but uh, his inspiration has been so, for me personally, rooted and deep in me. Uh, people call me bishop and all those titles. It is his influence and the deposit in my life. Um, of course, we were the first founding church members uh, we were the first founding pastors. We were the first students. So our team was so consolidated, consistent in what we were doing. What Dr. Mumba said, we got excited and ran with it. It was a great joy. Wow, you mentioned something about first, so I would call you the first fruit of Victory Ministries. And also, I want to take this moment to say thank you very much for the great price that you paid uh, in ministry to pave way for all of us. And uh, we are standing uh, on the shoulders of your great sacrifice and uh, all the prayers that you prayed and everything that you put in place. We are functioning because you did your part. But let me uh, uh, drive in something from what you have said. You were a consolidated team. You... You wear everything, you would put up posters, you would pray, you would cast out demons, you do everything. So what, what really jumps out immediately to me is that your motives were right. In fact, we are talking today, our discussion centers around the topic, where is your interest? Because it shows that your interests were right. So how did you manage to do all these things just a small team, and you did it joyfully. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Um, you see, when he, you fail to understand the, the visionary and his vision, then you will misfire. We have uh, so many preachers today who began very well, but because of the stuff wow. they've compromised or diverted, they're doing something else. When he, the ministry began, the emphasis has always been the kingdom of God. Whatever you are doing, focus on the kingdom of God. And that, in the heart of uh, uh, Pastor Jeston Katebe, Jefferson Changwa, Lazarus Mira, myself, we envision that. Of course, all of us were gifted differently. Uh, Pastor Katewe used to lead worship, worship both church crusade. Um, I taught counselors. 
Pastor Amira was a technician. Uh, Pastor Changwa was more in intercession, but you know, we team up together, but very consolidated. We made sure we are doing things upright without interfering into each other's jurisdiction. And we went that way and we saw things work out in a way. People thought the ministry was so big. There are people, I remember when we were doing a crusade in Ndola, a group of pastors said, we want to come to Kitwe and see how you operate. Because they'd never seen a thing like that. So, yes. So to answer your question, our focus has already been centered on advancing the kingdom of God, not our personalities. Um, there are so many today <clears throat> who have diverted from the calling because they want their personality discharged. They want the attention of the people on themselves. But the vision of the ministry was centered and has been centered on advancing the kingdom of God. That's where Zambia shall be saved comes from. Because once we advance the kingdom of God, there will be salvation. For God so loved the world that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Where do you find that life? In the kingdom of God. Whose king is he? The king of kings. Amen. So that's why we were so bonded together. Right. Um, a follow-up uh, question or comment on that one. Earlier before the program, we discussed a situation that happened during the transition um, when Eli was, was a priest. And of course, there was compromise with his sons and everything. And then just explain that to highlight the, um, about focus, uh, the interest, how the nurses or the midwives who were, um, who were around this woman missed the point and the focus. Just uh, shed a little more light on that one. It really caught my attention. Thank you. Um, Eli was a very interesting priest. When you look through the scriptures... I find that Eli was not a communicator of what he knew, what needed to be communicated. Secondly, um, he, for failing to, communi to communicate, he also failed to understand his congregation. Why have I said that? Number one, the first time we hear Eli, is he? the Hannah confrontation. Right. Hannah, number one, is misunderstood by their husband. When he, she's, she was grieving, yes. the husband says, why are you grieving? I love you yes. more than these seven children. Mm -hmm. But yes, yes, you love me, but is that what I'm looking, is that, that satisfies me? Hannah needed a child. So the husband failed to understand Hannah. She goes to church. The priest, Eli, misunderstood and took her to be drunken. Now, the positive and good side of Eli was when you explain your problem, he knew how to align you for your victory. So at first, he said, you drunken woman, can you stop this nonsense? The woman says, no, I'm not drunk. I need a child. Oh, you need a child? Let it be so. And he, she goes home. Secondly, Eli did not communicate the kingdom of God to his own sons. Why have I said that? When we look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible says the sons of Eli were sons of Belial or certain. So why? He did not disciple them from childhood. But he had knowledge that God punishes every offender. Why have I said that? Because when you read verse 22 of 1 Samuel 2, 
he tells them in a very compromising manner, if you offend God, who will plead for you? Wow. So he understood God punishes, but he did not disciple his children into the fear of God. Right. Thirdly, when we come to Samuel, Samuel grew up in the administration of Eli. Yes. When he, we read verse 7, the Bible says Samuel didn't know the word of the Lord, had no revelation of God. So what, what was the, the young man then you know, doing in the temple? So, he's, okay, sweep there. Put the candles there. Light the candles. That's all Samuel knew. Right. He was not introduced to the knowledge of God. Right. When God called him, he could not identify the voice of God or differentiate it from the voice of Eli. So he runs to Eli. Right. So it's the same thing today right. that most of us only know the human voice. Mm -hmm. We don't know the voice of God. Why? Because the people who are communicating with us, we are dealing with, have lacked or don't have that experience yes. that needs to be communicated, which needs to be deposited to transform the upcoming generation. Right. Right. Now, what did that birth? Because Phineas and Hophi were the ones now where in the altar. Right. So what do we hear about them? They were sleeping with women in the temple and they mismanaged the temple. They mismanaged the, pe the people. What happens? They're in charge of the ark, the ark which represents the presence of God, the, you know, the glory of God. Mm. They go to fight with the Philistines. Mm. The Philistines beat them up. Then they come and said, ah, why have we been beaten? Bring the ark. Who carried the ark? The sons of Belial. The same guys who didn't know God, who were living in sin. And Israel suffered more losses. Then they said, ah, why? So the Philistines took the ark, went with it. Then news reaches Eli, the ark has been taken. Eli falls off the seat, dies. He, because he had two sad news. Yes. The ark taken. Your sons have been killed. Mm. The man dies. Mm. Then the daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, hears the news. That's she, it gets interesting. Uh-huh. Now, you need to understand, the Bible says she was expecting. Right. So she was about to, you know, her days of delivery were approaching. When she heard the news, she went into labor and he gave birth. So, the women that surrounded her, which are called the midwives, midwives helps the mothers to, you know, give birth. They encourage them. When it's so painful, no, be strong, push, be strong, push, which are I call these midwives the elders, the deacons, the people who surround the visionary. Yes. These are the ones that uh, encourage you. You call them for prayer meetings, you share your vision with. So, Phineas' wife gives birth. What did the women say? They say, be of good courage. You have delivered this child as well. But... What I know about women is that when she gives birth, she wants to see the child. She wants yeah, to know uh -huh, immediately like she's not the one. But not Phineas' wife. Why? Her passion for the glory of God. How shall I raise this child in the absence of the glory of God? So that's why the church today is in a mess because we teach people without the glory, the absence of God is not there. And that's why some of us go to witch doctors and do all kinds of things to see the power. We come on the pulpit, your telephone number is 09 what? Are we, you know, that 
is not what we are called for. We have been called to transform lives by the Holy Spirit. So Phineas' wife focus was on the glory of God. How can I raise my child without the glory of God? Because when I come to church, I need transformation. I need the knowledge of God. My life to be soaked in the presence of God. But there is no glory. So Phineas' wife did not celebrate her son. Why? No glory. Now, the, wow. the midwife, uh, our leaders, uh, our deacon, our associate pastors, who come, oh, pastor, Lelo, church, diwa Lelo, it was great. 2,000 people, 5,000, the offering, you know. But if you don't understand what you are there for, you will celebrate carnality than what you are supposed to celebrate. Phineas, wife, couldn't pay attention to the women, why? No glory. So may we examine the people who surround us. That's amazing because, like you have said, uh, Phineas' wife is centered on the glory. Yes. The midwives are centered on the fruit. Yes. And they do not understand that the fruit is of no effect without the glory. So, like what you're saying is it's sometimes you have the leadership that moves away from the glory of God because mostly the people we work with, the people that surround us, are looking for results, but they are not ready to go through the process. They are not ready um, to, to pay the price. And please marry this with the story of um, uh, Jesus um, with his disciples asking who he was, and uh, how they move on, uh, moved on, and how Peter missed it in the midst of the revelation. Please uh, make comments on that. Thank you so much. So the midwives are only interested in how many people came to church. The church is growing. The midwives are only interested in how much money came into church. That even when you share your vision, sometimes it will be difficult for them to find what you want to do. They make your life, your work, difficult. So this is how many today have missed it. How have they missed it? Because they listen to the midwives. And they want to walk with the midwives. The same thing, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, we read from verse 13. Jesus asked the disciples. Now, you need to understand that the Bible says when they came to the border of Caesarea, Philippi. He asked that question at the border. Right. Why did he ask the question at the border? The thing is that the Philippines knew Jesus as di differently okay. and Jesus didn't want his team to be confused by what the Philippines mm. interpreted who Jesus was. So he asked them a question. And this is one thing that most of us lack. We need to take stock of what we're doing. Right. We need to take stock. Are these men and women who I'm working with understand what I am doing? Because many times we, we come, people fall down, hallelujah, praise God. But where is the transformation? Mm. Mm. I love seeing people fall down. I love prophecy. Mm. But... My interest is a transformation. Because that's what Jesus came for. To take away that which defiles us. That which makes us look black, dark. It doesn't matter the color of the skin. But that which just have arrested your heart, pollutes your mind, pollutes everything that you cannot live the real you. There are so many people today who are not living their real life. They live the opposite. So Jesus says, what do people tell, say uh, I am? You are Jeremiah. Was Jesus Jeremiah? No. You are Isaiah. Was Jesus Isaiah? No. You are the old prophet. Was Jesus the old prophet? No. So this is where you, this is where you find us have lost their vision. Because 
they focus on what is not. They are business people who have lost their businesses because they have focused on what is not. They are wives and husbands who have lost their marriages because they focus on what is not. Politicians have diverted from what they were supposed to do because they focused on what is not. So most of us have lost it because we focused on what is not. Because Jesus was not Jeremiah. Then he pushes the question to the same people, said, okay, what about you? Then Peter, by the revelation from on high, you are the Christ, son of the living God, 100%. After that revelation, Jesus began to explain to them how he would die in Jerusalem. So you need to understand that revelation will always attract the mysteries of the kingdom, the depth of the kingdom. You begin to see what others don't know, don't see, but you'll be reading the same scriptures. So Jesus explains the format of his death. Now you need to understand that Peter is the one who said you are the Christ, son. Uh -huh. When he had the format of the crust like he said ah you go through shame he pulls jesus aside mm -hmm. and say this can't be and how did jesus address that he said get thee behind me certain for your interest are the interest of men not of god mm -hmm. so many times you get a revelation but how to understand the revelation is another thing. How to execute the revelation is another thing. So Peter diverted, shift from the revelation into the human flesh. So when you and me hear God and our congregants say, no, no, not that way, not that way. The question is who is influencing them? Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Maybe let me simplify this. When you go to 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1, mm -hmm. the Bible says, Satan rose against David and he, uh, tempted him, uh, yeah, tempted him to number the people. So the idea of numbering could be very good, but who inspired? Right. Whose idea? So when he, Peter said, not this way. Jesus saw the influence behind that. So in the midst of revelation, you are, don't think that you are just, no. The enemy will still want to come in to interfere with that revelation because he knows once you execute the revelation, he is in big trouble. trouble. And he, alas, most of us, have gone the root of Peter's idea. Not this way. The glory does not just come. You have to go through the shame, the embarrassment, the hate. But at the end of that, when you cross over, whew, hallelujah, praise man. God. And everybody begins to go, yay! He's our man. He's our man. So, my appeal today is as we discuss this and as people are listening is please do you understand the visionary? Do you understand the vision of the visionary? Because the moment I refuse to go through that shame, what happens? I give the dominance to Satan. So that anointing that you feel when you pray but because you have listened to the influence of certain, you will not see the very fragrance, the very depth of what God called you to, to do. Wow, something important we need to highlight here. Uh, viewers, there's a very strong message here that I want us to focus on from what uh, Reverend Gamaliel has explained in the book of Matthew chapter 16. Jesus 
is with his disciples, his assistants, his leadership. And um, of course, many things have been explained, but Peter has got a revelation of who Jesus was. And Peter is looking forward to the moment when they'll come into their glory. But Peter is not ready to walk with Jesus through shame. Peter is not ready to pay the price. And this happens mostly in the leadership circles. It happens in church. It happens everywhere when we have to make hard decisions in order to get to where we have to be. I know there are so many times when you leaders, you serve around a man of God. And we are not talking about a man of God being out of place or being out of the will of God. If he's out of the will of God, it's a different story. But we are talking about um, when it becomes uncomfortable for us to go through a process and at that moment, normally we pull back. We pull back and we want to draw our leader to a comfortable position and solution. Some of the things that God does do not require comfortability. We have to pay the price. The Bible says in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. There is a moment we have to endure the cross. The Bible continues to say, despising the shame, we go through a process of shame. Leadership is not always glamorous. Leadership is not always attractive. We need to pay the price together. And we cannot pull our leader to our conclusions. Because sometimes our conclusions are not right. Reverend Gamaliel, how do you handle now your leadership that is pulling you to a place you believe this is not what God wants me to do. We need to pay the price. We need to do it this way. It looks very unpopular. It looks very, um, it is attracting a lot of criticism, a lot of shame, but you know that it is the way to glory. But you are working with a leadership that is not ready to go with you. All right. Thank you for that question. Uh, number one, Jesus didn't he chase the twelve for not understanding. Exactly. He remained with them. Exactly. But what was he doing with them? He taught them the principles of the kingdom. Despite them not understanding. Um, look at all the way to the cross. Before he goes to the cross, he is still with them. And when he's just about to, to be taken to go to the cross, he even takes them to a place of prayer. Actually, one of the disciples, um, when Jesus is about to be crucified, still same guy we were talking about in chapter 16, he uses a human and earthly system to deal with something that is uh, divine. Can you please shed a little more light on that? Jesus takes Peter and his team to a place of prayer. Jesus says, we have come here to pray. Yes. They slept. He's not praying. He's not praying. So when leaders avoid prayer meetings, they are dangerous to your ministry. Say that again, sir. <laughs> when leaders avoid prayer meetings, they are dangerous. They are a poison to your leadership, to your ministry, to the anointing, to the growth of the ministry. Now, our fear many times is how to remove them. Right. But despite that, Jesus continued praying mm. with them. So, how do I handle that? Mm. Number one, he, was, he still continued teaching them. Right. At every level, remember one time they, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Pray. So pray with them. I remember one Sunday I asked you one gentleman who I was growing up into leadership. I said, can you close in prayer? He couldn't pray. Now, the man, you know, very zealous and looking, you know. So that hit him hard. He went home thinking and uh, it troubled him the whole week. That was his breakthrough into prayer. His commitment just changed. Oh, I didn't know. Until some time later, I said, 
Pastor, you remember that Sunday you asked me to pray? I couldn't remember. So let's continue teaching them. Let's continue praying with them. Now, you look at Peter. Peter gets up from sleep. He sees the master. So he goes back to Matthew chapter 16. It can't be this way. He strikes the sword. So when we don't pray, we are violent. Oh. When we don't pray, we hate. Right. When we don't pray, we act outside the principles of the word of God. Amen. Prayer aligns us into what God has called us mm. to do. Prayer aligns us into the visionary. Now, how did Jesus respond to that? He said, Peter, we don't act like that. How do we act? How shall scriptures be fulfilled? So he takes him back to the mission statement Jesus came for. But did it please Peter? Did it please the rest? The, the Bible says they fled and forsook him. So Jesus re remained focused on that mission. So how do I handle people like that? Number one, I teach them. If there is no compliance to what I'm teaching, then we better please uh, let's part company. Because I have a mission statement of the passion of God, the cry of God, the heartbeat of God to see people into the kingdom of God. I have no better ways. The good thing, when you look through the scriptures, to who did Jesus send the Holy Spirit? The same people, the same people. who fled and forsook him. So, they may not understand you, but have confidence in them because there is a season of transformation. Um, we, we'll be running towards the conclusion. Um, I want you to comment now because as a leader, you are being pulled sometimes by the people you're leading, by your leadership, because every person who is serving, sometimes they even feel they've got better uh, understanding and ideas of how it should be done. Um, so it, there arises the issue of um, um, you being pulled to the degree that you can lose focus. And sometimes, on the other hand, the, we, we end up creating or raising cadres whose job is just to praise us to the degree where it, even, it becomes destructive. Let me cite an example. You are going to um, uh, take it up from there as we wrap, wrap it up. There is an apostle in the book of Acts who is praised by a wrong spirit. Yeah. Uh, just tell us how that thing was handled. Okay. Um, thank you. That's what, that one is very, very interesting. This is where church usually today most are. Uh, we like praises from people yes. than executing the purposes of God. Yes. Paul was highly anointed. Mm -hmm. When I read the book of Acts, I read his letters. Yes. People ask me questions. How do you understand this? Mm -hmm. There are moments I sit I said, let me go to the school of Apostle Paul. Yes. So I will read him in the book of Acts and go through his letters, the depth. Then he, the Bible says he, that young lady who had the spirit of divination, right. she didn't do it one day. No. She did it many days. Yes. It is until the Holy Spirit engaged Paul. It's not me. It's not God. So... There are most of us, or many of us, who operate under that divination. What does that mean? How can you see it? Sometimes it may not come that way. Yes. Our members come to church. They are expecting the pastor, Pastor Simwanza, Cyrus Simwanza, to prophesy. Yes. Lay hands on them to cast out that demon, that cancer, and all that. Have they come to worship God? No. 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 And the Gamero Manza comes to church at the back of his pocket. He has the whole list of rentals, 
uh, school fees and all that. Have I come to minister? No. no. So we only meet to oppress each other. So whatever I am doing, I want to appease you. Right. I am prophesying, but it's not the spirit of God. Hmm. All what I'm doing is that I want my budget to meet. All what I'm doing is to make you smile so that when you go, but it's something far away from your demands. You go home, praise God. The church was part of the pastor, prophet. But was it the prophet of God? No. So it's a high time. The preacher and his congregation got interested in the affairs of God. When Peter, when he poor cast out that demons, what happened? They beat him up. This is what most of us are scared to deal with the real deal. Right. We are afraid of the beating. Right. Because they beat him. How do we get beaten as preachers? Oh, you preach like this? I stop giving my tithe. Wow. Who will not pay your rent. Wow. Who will not, you know. Mm. So that way, what do we do? thrown into prison. Thrown in the prison, remember to praise God. He called you, you are part of who, the real deal. So, I want to emphasize and I want to talk to the people that are listening to this program. Please, congregation, when you come to church, the Bible says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul longs after me. Desire God. Come to church desiring God. God, my fellow pastor, when you pray, don't just, God, the anointing, you know, a desire to know him. Mm. Moses, despite all the anointing, the power that was manifested in Egypt, still tells God, God, I want to see your face. I want to know you. Yes. Paul, despite, you know, mm -hmm. the first time I'm reading, the handkerchiefs came from Paul, yes. the aprons. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. I press towards the mark to know the high calling so that I may know him. So may I first prioritize the knowledge of God, the presence of God, that when I appear, people will be impacted. When they come, Jesus said, let him that is thirsty come to me and drink. So they must come thirsting for the infilling. For me, that's the way forward. Amen. Amen. While our viewers, I believe that has been very interesting and very uh, revealing. Uh, Paul entertained that evil spirit. Just like uh, you and I sometimes, like uh, a Reverend has said, we sometimes, uh, for, for, for a number of days, Paul entertained that lady because she was showering praises. That was free publicity and uh, adver uh, adver advertism that was going on until the Spirit of God struck him and said, it's not about you. So we need to come to that moment where we know that all glory belongs to God. It's not for us. We need to come to the place where we know that we are only his tools. And we want to appeal to you, our church members. We want to appeal to you. Come to church for right reasons. Don't come to church for a miracle. Come to church for Christ. Don't come to church for prophecy. Come to church for Christ. Because at the end of the day, if Christ is not glorified, everything else is amiss. Reverend Gamaliel, your closing remarks to the people who have joined us and um, whatever you want to impart in them. Well, I go back to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, that scripture has been very heavy on my heart, on most especially how Jesus addressed Peter. Get behind me certain. Not that Peter was certain, no. He was addressing the influence. David was influenced by Satan. So there are many times we have good ideas that look very good ideas. 
they are not from God. As long as they divert you from the very cause. Uh, number one, to those of us pastors, please, when you get an idea or counsel from their leaders, their associates, weigh it, prove it. Is it in line with what God called me? Is it in line with the purposes of God that we are supposed to be? Secondly, we must know that the failure to adhere to what God called us, we bring the dominance of certain. Because that idea Paul, I mean Peter mentioned, was not influenced by God, the Spirit of God. It was demonically influenced. So when we pay attention to the human knowledge, we bring the dominance of de demons in the ministry, and this is when somehow we begin to fight with our leaders. We begin to, you know, confusion in the congregation. The anointing doesn't flow. Why? Because we submitted to what was not God. Um, I had a man of God from Zimbabwe. He went to camp to pray for the conference that they were going to have. He was there 14 days praying and fasting. God gave him the theme for the conference. Then he came to share to, to his leaders what God said to him. The elders who were not in that prayer closet, Pastor Silas, changed the theme. No, Pastor, this. And the pastor listened. So when the conference started, the first two speakers were his guests. Both of them spoke into the conference God gave the man of God. So what did the man of God do? He went on the stage, repented, apologized, changed the theme. And I want to say the same thing to those of us that are listening. Please, when you realize it is wrong, stand out. This is not. It is this. So when we don't comply with the calling, we listen to man's ideology. We bring the dominance of demons in the ministry. Thirdly, those of us who surround the pastor, please develop, number one, an attitude of studying the word of God. When you study the word of God, it will align you and keep you focused on the vision that God gave your pastor. Two, develop a spirit of prayer. When you pray, you'll be engaged into what God wants to do in that ministry. When Victor Ministries started, people thought it was a very big ministry. We had the minister had a lot of money, so many structures, and some people even pushed, we are coming to Kito, we want to see how you operate. But what made the ministry that big? It's because the whole staff focused on the vision, Zambia shall be saved. All of us, my, my, my job description was teach counselors, train them to cast out demons. Pastor Katewe led worship, Lazarus Mira, of course, have, you know, technical. Pastor Changwa, more into uh, intercession. All of us did that, but focusing on the vision, Zambia shall be saved. As we pursued that, Dr. Mumba just spent time praying and studying the scriptures. I mean, uh, this I can say, he has said it everywhere. In fact, some people who go to see him, so I am saying, uh, quoting his words. So please, let's understand the vision. Don't divert the vision. Remain focused on the vision. Remember, for us, for God to do much more, number one, the psalmist in Psalm 42, verse 1, as a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after you. So may your soul begin to offload its luggage and pursue God. In Psalm 63, the psalmist says, O oh God, early will I seek you. As the dry, thirst-patched land, 
thirsteth for water, so my soul longs for. May we delight in God, desire God, pursue God. Jesus said in John 7, verse 37, Whoever is thirsty, one version says, Whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So, may we come to the Lord thirsting. When we come thirsting, then he will fill the cup. He, Jesus further said in verse 38, He who believes on me, as scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So it's not what you think or your ideology. It is the scriptures. Jesus said, how shall the scriptures be fulfilled? So his coming was not to impress you or impress me, but to fulfill the scriptures. So please, pastor, congregants, let's settle and rest in the scriptures. God bless you. Thank you very much, all our viewers. It's been a pleasure. We pray that God will plant this word in your heart. And um, it's all about correction and alignment. We pray that God will bless you. And uh, as you go to church and as you go to serve, you are going there to serve with the right purpose and right reason. It's not self-serving. It is about the kingdom of God. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have never prayed to receive Jesus Christ, we want to give you this opportunity. Simply pray with us and say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. I accept your love. I accept the sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, may God bless you. And we once again say thank you to Reverend Gamaliel Monza for sparing uh, these precious minutes with us today. We love you all. Until we see you again at the same time, we say bye-bye for now. Bye.